All right. Let's talk to Father. Father, we thank you that you talk to us. We thank you that you have given us ways in which we can recognize and know for sure that it's your voice. So as Father, as we continue on the glorious voice, would you begin to speak to us in new ways, begin to develop more of your language with us, we pray in your precious name. Amen. All right. So we're, we're starting tonight on ways of proving God's voice. This, again, should have been taught to us when we first came to the Lord. And I had pastors who have been pastoring 20 and 30 years ask me how you can be sure you've heard the voice of God. And I believe that we can be sure. And so one of the things we're going to talk about tonight is ways of proving whether you've heard God's voice. So, there are ways given in Scripture of proving whether we've heard His voice or another voice. Remember Paul said, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14.10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them without significance. Every voice, even yours, is significant. But we're listening for one voice. That's the one we want to hear and obey. So he made this statement about these voices. And in 1 Thessalonians, 5 and 21. And I love this because it gives us ground. Some people are so afraid to test what they've heard because they might not recognize or know or know how to prove that it's God. But in, in 1 Thessalonians 5 21, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Do you know something? It means some of the things that you prove will not prove out. You only have to hold fast to that which is good. And let me say this, and this could get me in trouble, but let me get in trouble. There are some things that are good for you that are not good for me. I have got to know his voice and his heart for me so well that I am willing to let go of something that God told you to hold on to. Now this is possibly the most important scripture on this subject. When we think of proving God, the question arises, how? Because many of us were brought up in a, in a religious culture that says you don't question God. What if you don't know whether it's Him or not? So when he said, prove all things, I believe he meant what he said. Yeah, levels with the will of God. Malachi 3 and 10. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And what? Prove me not. Now, how many know that people only use this for the offering? That's okay. Yeah. I said, how many people realize that most people only use this scripture for the offering? Right? It's one of the ones that's abused, I mean used for offerings all the time. But there's more to it than that. If it was just for offering, he wouldn't talk about opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out what? Not money, although it may come in money, but in blessings, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. There are three, and this, this was interesting to me when I studied Leviticus. Okay? Numbers in Leviticus. I studied the tithe because I really felt like we didn't have it right. Okay? So the tithe goes to the priesthood Numbers 18 and 26. It doesn't go to the building program. When you come to Torah lesson, when I teach tabernacle, you'll understand. But the tithe goes to the priesthood. Okay? Not to the building program. 
The tithe that is set aside, there's a second tithe that is set aside so I can appear before God during the feast, feasts of the Lord. Do you realize that God was so concerned that I meet with him that he made it mandatory to set aside enough, another 10%, to go to the three feasts throughout the year. See, he mandated the feast so he paid so you could go. That's Deuteronomy 14, 22, and 23. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because at every feast they also had to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Some of the meat of that went to the priests. Okay? The tithe, then there's a tithe that's spread over three years. That is for the widow, the orphan, and the strangers in the gate. It's like a welfare tithe, Deuteronomy 14, 28, and 29. So then the total tithe is 23 and a third percent. And it covered leadership, the priest, civil government, and welfare. And they kept all the rest, or 77% of their income. Remember that when they decided they wanted a king, one of the first things Samuel said to them, or God said to them, it's going to cost you another 10%. So when we separate the government from God, it's more expensive. By the way, in the millennial reign, we're going to be back to this. Not because it's Jewish law, but because it's God's economy. Big difference. When a king was crowned, he forced another 10% to be collected. This brought the tithe or the taxes to 33 or one-third of their income. Now, if you count in all the taxes today, we're probably paying close or over 50% of our income in tax. Because you tax what's already been taxed and you tax it again. In Judges 6, 39, And Gideon said unto, the, unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, but I will speak but this once. Let, <clears throat> let me prove, I pray thee, let me prove. I, listen, he'd had an angel. He'd seen the angel burn up the sacrifice. Then after that, God talked to him himself. And he said, now God, don't get angry with me. I still want to prove whether it's you or not. Did God get angry with him? Hello? No. God did not get angry with him. God is not angry with you. He's out to persuade you. Um... Ellie, would you hand me my Bible, please? I want you to turn to Hebrews. You know, God's coffee book, Hebrews? She doesn't, he does. <laughs> Hebrews 11. Because of how we've all been taught and brought up, I love to bring in this scripture whenever I can. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. And it's just finished talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's start at verse 12. Therefore sprang there even one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off. They caught a vision of the promises of God. What's that next phrase? And were persuaded of them. When God brought that to my attention, he said, how many books did they have? 
They didn't have any books as far as we know. Nothing was written as far as we know. So who persuaded them? God himself persuaded them. Oh, I wish we could hear that. Is he the same yesterday, today, and forever? And this, in Gideon's life, Gideon, Gideon is an illustration of God persuading a doubtful man. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he said, now let me prove thee, or let me prove I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground let there be dew. Here we find Gideon proving God concerning a specific word he'd heard. Not proving the scriptures, not proving the Old Testament, not proving the Torah, but concerning a specific word that he had heard. The interesting thing is that he first heard this word through the physical appearance of an angel. Still not convinced. This clearly puts using the fleece as a way of proving God. In the multitude of voices that are speaking in the world, we need to learn to hear and learn to prove the voice of God. It is through this that we will know the truth of John 10 and 5. A stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. God has set up a plan and a relationship with us that he wants to get us to a place where we will not hear the voice of strangers. We'll only hear his voice. Now that's whether he speaks sovereignly, whether he speaks through someone in the world, whether he speaks through an ass, or what, however he speaks, we'll recognize his voice. He said, he also said, I think it's in the, uh, a little further than this, he said, that um, they will hear his voice and not be able to hear another. Isn't that something? We can come to a place where there can be such a relationship with God that we know his voice and we do not recognize another one. He's the one that said it. Jesus said it. And so far, he's never lied. I don't think he planned it. He's the Lord. He changes not. So he's not going to start now. So if I think he's lied to me, it's my understanding of what he said, not what he said. In defining the ways that God gives us to prove his voice, it's important that we allow the Spirit of God room to move. By the way, often he moves a lot slower than we'd like. I wonder if that's to test our faith. Remember that it's the Holy Spirit that came to take all things concerning Jesus and show them unto us. Everything that the Holy Spirit does should in some manner teach us more about Jesus and reveal more of Jesus to us. So let's look at the fleece from Judges 6, 36 to 40. God has spoken to Gideon both through an angel and through the word of the Lord by his voice. We'd be afraid to ask God again if that happened to us. If we heard the audible voice of God and saw an angel, we'd be afraid to ask. Either it's the depth of Gideon's insecurities or his feeling that he's not worth anything or something. But Gideon was not afraid to ask God to prove what he'd heard from an angel, what he'd heard via the voice of God. Gideon is one who has no confidence in his ability to hear or see. He has to put before the Lord a test to prove with the fleece the word of the Lord. Now, I was taught growing up that the fleece is for those 
who really um, it's it's the weakest proving and yet look at what Gideon had already heard from God and he needed the proof in the ways of proving God we want to first treat the use of, the, of fleeces uh, and here is the definition of a fleece that I hope we can catch a fleece is placing before the Lord something that would without supernatural workings from God it would be impossible it is a dependence upon the supernatural for God to prove himself So here's some interesting factors. Gideon was from the family of the lowest standing in the tribe of Manasseh. So there's no confidence. He had no confidence in the flesh. Gideon was least thought of in the family or the household. Gideon was full of fear. How do I know? Where did they find where did the angel find him? They found him grinding grain in the wrong place at the wine press that wasn't the place you're supposed to grind grain but he was hiding and you see it wasn't wine season so he could get away with it Gideon doubted his own eyes and ears Gideon had very low self esteem Gideon required convincing Listen, all of us require convincing, whether we want to admit it or not. If we admit it, God can convince us. If we don't, we tie God's hands. Although he was obedient to the first of the instructions, he did it in the least noticeable way because he was afraid. What were the first instructions? Your dad has a grove to idols. Go and, uh, and, and your tribe, cut that, or get rid of the grove and, bur and get rid of the idol. So he did it at night. I would say that indicates a bit of fear. Right? And Gideon required ongoing convincing. And God was not afraid to give it to him. I wish we could hear that. God never once remonstrated Gideon for needing more proof. That would really deal with some of the doctrine that's out there. You hear it once, you don't have faith if you don't believe. No, 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 no. God persuaded Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, Adam. God persuaded Job. Do you think he's going to change? He knows my frame that I am dust. The second time Gideon wanted to make sure it was God speaking, he asked if he could prove God again. God answered the first one. In this case, God was not heard. It seems that Gideon went ahead and set the parameters of the test. Gideon set the parameters. God, by answering the way he did, told us much. It's imperative that we see all that is implied by God's action in the matter. Number one, God is merciful. He did not judge Gideon for doubting. Therefore, we should not judge one another for doubting. If God didn't judge him, who are we to judge? Second of all, God is long-suffering. He spent time convincing Gideon and allaying his doubts and fears. God will never get you in such a hurry that you don't have time to prove what God is saying. If someone is in a hurry, I question whether they've heard or not. 
How many know God speaks from eternity? And how many know that He usually waits longer than we want Him to? He's not in a hurry. Never has been. He spent 4,000 years getting the world ready for the Messiah. Setting the stage. And he spent 2,000 years trying to get his bride ready. He's not in a hurry. Yes. Right. Yes. Remember this, okay? We live in time. We're the ones that think we've got a dead end somewhere. Okay? But God, first of all, He knows our frame that we're dust. Second of all, He knows our destiny. Third, He sets the stage at the right time to get us to our destiny. If he reveals to us our destiny, he knows how long it's going to take to get there. And he already knows when we're going to say, uh, or I don't understand that. He has factored in that time for us to get to our destiny. Okay? So, when God, remember this also. God can do everything He asks us to do without us. Okay? He could have gone like that and the Midianites would have exploded. So, when God told me that, you know, I was reading these stories about the Jewish people to whom Jesus is appearing and the Muslims and the folks behind the curtains. And I said, God, what do you need me for? If you can do all these things by yourself, what do you need me for? He said, it's because of the work it'll do in you. You're being prepared for eternity. God's got an eternal work for you to do. All of time is here that I might manifest the measure of the Word He wants me to manifest. The Word became flesh. Well, if it became flesh in Jesus, why does God give us the Word? He wants the Word to become flesh in us. I think sometimes we have to change our thinking. Because we have to realize we are eternal beings on a temporary journey. Number three, God desires to convince us of his desire to use us. He convinced all of the early patriarchs. They had nothing in writing till Moses, and God had to convince Moses, didn't he? Because Moses didn't get the Ten Commandments till Sinai. So all of that time, you realize that that's exactly what God was doing in Egypt with the plague? He was convincing Pharaoh that he was God and he was convincing Israel that he was God and that he wanted them. And it took him all... See, when God separated them in Egypt between Goshen and Egypt, from that point on, God was trying to convince Israel that he could keep them in any circumstance. He could have raptured them out he hadn't, didn't do it then, he's not going to do it now. Oh, yeah, right, all right. <laughs> God will go to whatever measure necessary to convince us if our heart is right in the matter. That's comforting, isn't it? In our lives, it's important to realize that God wants us to know his voice. I believe that's the most important thing in the life of a Christian. The voice of God. Because you see, we have the book to confirm how he speaks, but there is nothing 
but relationship with him that's going to convince us of his voice. Right. Okay. Sometimes we need to do a study just to see. Because of this, as we keep our hearts before him, he will allow us to test the word we've received. He not only wants to prove the word, he wants us to try the spirit behind the word. You know the illustration of this is Jesus in the... uh, when he was tried before he was released into ministry? You catch that? Why? Because you see, everything that God receives is going to be tried. He gives us a word, we go through the trial, and the word becomes flesh. Jesus' response to Satan in the test was, it is written. He was not talking about written in a book somewhere. He was talking about what was written on his heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we have an indication in Corinthians that God writes with the pen of the Spirit and sometimes through the voice of his ministry on the hearts of the people. You are our epistles, read and known of all men, manifestly declared to be the epistle of God written by us. Not, on, not with pen and ink, but on the fleshly tables of the heart. God, by speaking to you, by His Spirit, is endeavoring to write something on your heart that's going to come out your mouth and out your life. It's important that we realize that God is writing something for eternity. Jesus said, the words I speak, they are what? Spirit, and they are life. God wants to transfer you from the realm of literal to the realm of spirit and life. That's what this whole process is about that we're living in now. Verse John 4, 1, and th- 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are what? Where did they go from? They went up from the church. They gained their reputation as prophets in the church. And they went out from the church into the world. And because God does not take his gifts away, they probably merchandise what they'd received from God. Well, that's in another lesson. (laughs) But the thing is, we are going to touch that type of thing in this series that I'm doing on the voice of God. It is important that we learn how to discern what voice is speaking. And that's one of the things we're trying to do as we talk about the ways to prove the voice of God. To prove whether you've heard from God. Too many today are saying, God said... When God didn't say. Too many are saying, Thus saith the Lord, and it's little Lord, not large Lord. Hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, where of you have heard it should come and even now already is in the world. Now, I'm not sure whether I have on this next slide the Weiss translation of that, but the, let's look first before I say anything. Okay, it doesn't seem to be here. What it says in the Weiss translation, Dr. Weiss uh, was a Greek teacher at Moody Bible Institute, and he took 
and went through the New Testament, only the New Testament, but what he did was take as many words as necessary to communicate the sense of the passage. So here's what he said about that passage. He said, many false prophets, or those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come and remains in human flesh, are not of God. First, I question that. But have you ever read Revelation 4 recently? Who's on the throne? Not the Son of God, the Son of Man. And who's coming back? The Son of Man. So he remain, in that sense he remains in human flesh. Let me ask you another question. Does he live in you? So does he remain in human flesh? Anyone that denies that's possible is part of the Antichrist spirit. Because you see, the hope, your hope, is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Okay. That's why he's called the Son of Man. That was his favorite title for himself in the book of Luke. Often the word may be right, or it may be according to the letter of the Logos or the written word. The problem is that even the devil is able to what? When he tempted Jesus, did he quote it accurately? Absolutely. Probably even the right nuances. He may have even spoke Hebrew. Who knows? To Jesus. Jesus didn't say, well, I must submit to it because that's the letter of the word. Did he? He said, thou shalt not, with the letter of the word, Satan tempted Jesus. The spirit behind it is what makes it the word of God or otherwise. That's why believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether it be of God. Okay? The problem that the problem is that even the devil is able to quote accurately the letter of the word. After all, he's been to expose he's been exposed to it, the written word, since it's been written. So he knows it the letter accurately. And we found this in dealing with satanic ritual abuse survivors. Their handlers know the letter of the word well. But they do not know the spirit of the word. What he cannot do is quote it in the right spirit, nor can he put it in the right context. Because of his nature, he quotes the word. When he quotes the word, it's always in the wrong context or for the wrong purpose. This is the reason we must try the spirit behind the words. If the message or messenger is from the Lord, they will give you room to test and see if the word is from God. If they do not give room or try to condemn you for honest doubt, you should then at least suspect the origin of the word. Does that help? Okay, I can because it's written down. <laughs> if they do not give room or they try to condemn you for honest doubt, you should at least suspect the origin of the word. In other words, it bears further discernment. In 1 Samuel, revealing the, the Lord, in 1 Samuel 3 and 20, the Lord himself or the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed who? Oh, to Samuel in Shiloh. How did he reveal himself? What did he use? What was the vehicle? By the word of the Lord. Here's one of the most important principles of testing the word of the Lord. Is there some aspect of the Lord's character and nature revealed through the word of the Lord? I tell you, this one set me at ease 
because Jesus is the litmus test for everything. Okay? It is the heart of God to continually unveil himself in a greater and greater sense to his people. If we study the times when God revealed himself to the patriarchs, we find that with each new, uh, with each new need came a greater revelation of himself, his abilities, and his character traits. Each of these were manifest in order to show us the true heart of God. So, let's take an interesting litmus test. The nature of God, and this is from Exodus 34, 5-7. I took almost 15 years to write my book on my study on the nature of God. I started it back in the 90s. And God said, put it on the shelf. Now here's what I've discovered about God. If he tells you to put something on the shelf, he's got to teach you something before you write the next paragraph. In other words, not only were people possibly not ready to receive it, but I was not ready to write it. Because I had not experienced it as the Word made flesh. Okay? So the, the highest portion of the nature of God is merciful. Well, let's turn there for a moment and read the whole passage and then take down these points. So Exodus 34. God is appearing to Moses and declaring the name or the nature of God. Remember in scripture, na name is synonymous with nature. So, verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and pro proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and sin, or iniquity, transgression and sin, that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. Just let me say this about iniquity and the visitation. That still goes on in the world today for those who have not accepted Jesus. Because they're still under the law. They have not brought themselves under grace. And sometimes we wonder why people are going, sinners are going through things, and some of it is generational stuff. Because no one in their line has broken the generational line and brought it into Christ. That explained a lot of things to me because I was wondering why certain people were under certain things and why certain families who had not accepted the Lord were forever going through stuff. And I'm not, they have not submitted to coming out from under the curse. The only way to do that is come to Jesus. There's no other way to get out from under the curse because he became the curse for us. He bore the curse for us. He lifted the curse for us. But, on, but as to, only to as many as received him. Merciful. That's the highest nat por, um, attribute of the nature of God. How do I know? Because above the ark, in which dwelt the mercy, or in which dwelt, or above the mercy seat, no, above the ark, in which dwelt the law, the authority, the budding rod of Aaron, and the the revelation, the pot of manna, that which is the type of revelation. Above that was the mercy seat. The only thing that dwelt above the mercy seat 
was the manifest presence of God. We need to bring all our understanding under the mercy seat. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, abundant in truth. And then he has a reservoir of mercy. And if I'm going to be like him, what do I need to ask God to develop in me? A reservoir of mercy. Forgiving iniquity, forgiving transgression, forgiving sin. It is not automatic. If they do not repent, they are not automatically forgiven. Now, in one sense, they were forgiven at the cross. Okay? But if you don't accept what is given, you're not forgiven. Everything. Jesus, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. I step from perishing into non-perishing by accepting Jesus. Yes. That's, there's truth to that, but let me share this. Because I was talking to God about some of this. Remember, I came from legalism. Pentecostal legalism, but it was legalism. And we, we, we were the only ones saved, you know. So, one day I'm talking to God and he drops this scripture in my mind. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. I said, but God, what about believing Jesus? What about? He said, if they believe I am, that releases my Holy Spirit to teach them all the other things. Now, I believe there are, there are people who say, quote, the sinner's prayer, and because their heart is genuine, they receive salvation. But there are those who cannot point to their salvation experience. But they are saved. And they came, I don't want to call it the long way around, but they first of all believe that he is. And the woman at the well, she didn't, her actions showed her repentance. See, repentance is a 180 degree turn. That's what it is. There are places in scripture that talks about confession, but you know that's really for the saint, not the sinner. And what we've done is, again, we've tried to make one script one size fit all. Instead of realizing that really, although there's a sense in which God is simple in relationship to us, he's also complicated. Okay? And so, I need, I cannot find my way without the Holy Spirit. No man can come unto Jesus unless, what? The Father draw him. Oh, you mean it's the Father's love that sent Jesus. It's the Father's love that's working on my heart. Not that Jesus doesn't love us, don't get me wrong, but we have not emphasized the act of the Father in this. Jesus loves us with the love of the yes, he does. But see, there's, again, we've tried to make it all one nice, neat package. It's bigger than that. I remember I was, uh, I was brought up in a oneness church which basically said je everything was in Jesus. And then my mother, would, when she came home and took us, would not go to the oneness church because of her wounds. She went to a Trinitarian church. 
So in my little mind, great conflict. Because both of those churches were doctrine oriented. One day the Lord spoke to me and said, Bill, I'm bigger than both of them. Doesn't that settle something? See, we argue over doctrine. He's trying to get us into relationship. Okay? And if we have relationship, he will show us the doctrine. It's interesting. We say, i got to know the doctrine to do the will, but Jesus said, if you do the will, you'll know the doctrine. I'd rather do it his way. Okay? There are things that we're not mature enough to understand yet. And they come by revelation, not by study. Okay? And I might even lay out the revelation and you not get it. So maybe ten, ten years down the road you get it. Why? Because the Father revealed it. Knowing God only comes by revelation. It does not come by works. Pardon me? Even stu- well, if studying would have it, I'd have it. Okay? With all my degrees. But they don't mean a thing. Because I can, I can miss it. Study can miss it. Look at all the theologians. If nothing else would prove it, that would, wouldn't it? Whether they're Jewish theologians or Christian theologians. It has nothing to do with study. I study because he tells me to. Okay? But I don't study to gain brownie points. Too many study to gain brownie points. Okay. He provided a way for forgiveness if they will access it. If they do not repent, they're still guilty and do not clear them or their family line. Yes. Yeah? Right. I obey, I study because that's what he said to do, but I don't study for brownie points. I study and the Holy Spirit leads me in my study and then by how that, st- that study and how I deliver it under the power of the Spirit, that is what validates what I say. Only the Spirit can validate what I say. You have, a, you have within you the Holy Spirit. And it says we have... People take these two scriptures and make them knock heads. But Scripture says you have a Spirit, you have the Spirit within you, and you need that no man teach you. So you've got those that go off and do their own thing. I don't need... To be under apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. I don't need any government. I've got Jesus. But then the other thing is he said in Ephesians 4. He set in the church fivefold ministry. So there's a balance between those. Here's what the Lord said to me one day. He said, Bill, new life can only come with the union of two things. Depending on, you know, a male and a female. He said the anointing within unites with the anointing that descends and life is produced. So, uh, that's why I only have to, I'm going to be judged by what witness to my spirit, not what witness to my mind. Okay? I'm only clean through the word he's spoken to me. That's relationship, not reading the book. He may use the book to speak it to me. My spirit may witness to what I read in the book. And there are times when I've read that same passage multiple times, and then all of a sudden something from it witnesses to me, and it becomes life to me. We need to realize that without the Spirit, there is no life. Therefore, I must learn to hear the voice, but I must go back to the Spirit to tell me how to walk out what the voice is telling me to do. If they do not access the means of forgiveness, then the iniquity passes on down the family line to the fourth generation. Questions to ask in proving the voice. What of the character of God can I see in this word I'm receiving? Second of all, 
What of the nature of God is revealed by this word? Number three, how is the Lord himself revealed in the word? Now sometimes I have to go back and ask the Lord how it is. Because I'm so used to thinking on the human plane. And remember, I can never overemphasize this. It's the Holy Spirit that has been sent to take all things concerning Jesus and show them unto me. Therefore, I must go back to him and ask him how. If you sit in a class and you don't ask questions, who can you blame for not understanding? Teacher? And the Holy Spirit is the teacher, isn't it? So he's not... God is not upset with asking questions. Gideon is a case in point. Isn't he? Is there a further unveiling of him to me in this word? Now this works even for personal words that you receive prophetically from a prophet. This way of judging the word is not just for what you read, not just for what you hear personally, but it also can be applied to prophetic word that comes to us. Okay? In other words, I don't believe it necessarily because he or she is a great prophet or some prophet. I may consider it more thoroughly if they're a proven prophet or prophetess, but he said every word needs to be tried and the spirit behind it. I knew a man uh, was good prophetically the first few times he saw you. But after he thought you were committed to him, he began to use prophecy to manipulate. So the first prophetic words were probably dead on and probably right. But when he began to use it to manipulate it, it was a wrong spirit. One of the things we need to remember is, as God takes us on in Him, we must remain open to ongoing revelations of Him. Each dimension in God has a new revelation of Him to unveil to us. So let's pray. Lord, to know Your voice is so important. We're so thankful for the written Word of God, yet... We so need the Spirit of God to lead us in its interpretation. We thank you that you speak today and have provided instruction in the Scripture that allow and teach us how to check out what we're hearing. Thank you for your mercy and grace as we learn your voice. Father, would you keep giving us seeing eyes to be able to perceive the revelation of yourself in the Word? We would see Jesus Reveal yourself, we pray, through your Logos and Rhema. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. All right? Next installment will be on November what? The last Tuesday in November, I think. That would normally be yours, but I'm going to steal it. about the 29th, yeah. Okay? The next number of Tuesdays will be in Sister Lonnie's hands. By God's grace and tell your friends and come on out. Or, as we would say online, listen in. Okay. God bless.